Meet the kids who won't eat, won't sleep, won't behave. And the parents who take the rap. We've been slated left, right and centre. People say, that boy needs a good smack. Even Granny thinks Mum just needs to get a grip. She's a little bit lazy. Well, she is lazy. <laughs> Mum and Dad are desperate for a label like ADHD or autism... Oh. Why, why, Mum? ..to explain their child's behaviour. I think Billy's autistic. I suspect maybe ADHD. If it's not autism, what is it? <laughs> But could tough love be the solution? No! Is this just a naughty boy? It can take years for parents to get a definitive answer. This is what I'm up against, so, it, you know, I'm just getting nowhere. So family GP Dr Dawn Harper and paediatrician Dr Ravi Jairam are tackling this controversy head-on fast-tracking the process to see if medical help is needed. Do you think they're ready for this diagnosis? Or if the kids are just out of control. <laughs> two families, two kids, all hoping for answers. First up, with his passion for puds, is Bobby. He's a really, really pleasant, yeah. genuine, happy young boy. We just to want him to be... And eat a meal. Yeah. Like I say, he's never had a hot meal, has he, in his yeah. life? If somebody gives me something I don't like, it makes me feel sick. Mum and Dad are convinced that he has a serious food phobia. I'm Sally. I'm Craig. Uh, we've got two children, Bobby, who's eight. Cameron? And Cameron, who's just yeah. turned 13. Have you much of your pet lunch? I've got food syrup. Hey. In his pet lunch, he had a bar of chocolate, a yoghurt, a Milky Way, fruit gums, and a chocolate brownie. You didn't eat the brownie? <laughs> I don't like sandwiches. Potatoes, mushrooms, <laughs> peppers, <laughs> onions. I don't think he's ever had vegetables, really, has he? A odd pea here and there, that's it. He's never had any meat. I don't like pizza, cauliflower, fish, peas, carrots, Gammon. This is Bobby's bag. Um, normally when he comes in from school, he goes straight to the cupboard and he'll get something out of his bag to keep him going. Until you're put in that position, seeing your child either eat the chocolate bar or nothing, I'd soon see him eat the chocolate bar. Bobby's extraordinary eating habits are affecting the whole family, who are now hungry for answers. We're going to have a look at Bobby, who's an eight-year-old boy who lives in Doncaster. Mum and Dad think he's got a food phobia. This is what me, Sally and Cameron eat. This is Bobby's everyday fridge. His probiotic drinks, his yoghurts, he'll eat six of them after his beans and then two or three before he goes to bed as well. You look at that fridge and, and you immediately think, how can you let your child live off this incredibly unhealthy diet? We've tried health visitors, <laughs> dietitians. Well, this one's a baddie. Paediatricians. This is a three-headed dragon. Child psychologist. It's a two-headed lion. Behaviour clinics. This is a three-headed snake. <laughs> We're still at the same position. I don't think any of them know what his problem is. That's... No. We got referred to a child psychologist and she was saying, children do have genuine fears of food and it's like, me and you going into a restaurant and the waiter coming up to us and saying, here's a nice eyeball sandwich and squashing the two pieces of bread in the eyeball and its veins are bulging out from the sides of the bread and saying, it's really nice, eat it. And we're, there's absolutely no way in this world we would eat an eyeball sandwich. And whereas we might say a normal bowl of pasta, eat the pasta, it's lovely. They're thinking eyeball sandwich. Do you want to try and eat things? Yeah. What's stopping then, do you think, making you eat? Just trying it and biting into it. It makes me scared. Is this behaviour around eating part of a wider behaviour mm. problem? I was as well? waiting for him to start lining things up or being quite rigid about things actually, because being very picky about particular types of foods can be a sign of an autistic yeah. spectrum, can't they? But he seems to interact very normally. Uh -huh. Cheers. But when it comes to mealtimes, whether it's eyeball sandwich or just chicken and rice, things are far from normal. 
I mean, we don't yeah. think there's out physically wrong with him, do we? We just think it's it's all in his head. I'm convinced it's a psychological problem. Yeah. Maybe it isn't just Bobby. It's maybe the whole dynamic around food. It's not hurting Cameron because she's eating it. I can't do it. You can't do it. Why can't you do it? Tell me why you can't do it. It's just an anxiety about having that in his mouth. He, he doesn't like the feel, the texture, maybe. I don't like it. Yeah, yoghurt. That's as generally as far as it ever gets. Just sat there. We got a spoon. You could tell him we're getting upset. There's no point in making it any worse. Is this happening? He's not going to eat it because he knows if he doesn't eat, he's going to get six chocolate yogurts to eat. You know, two attempts at a mouthful and, oh, that's OK, have a yogurt. So mm. actually, there is no incentive. We've been slated left, right and centre. I'm going to fill a whole pack of these. How can you let your child have desserts before he's eating his main? And I would never do that. If you don't give him something he likes, he will starve himself. End. Gosh, where do you start? No. The, the issue is, this is a growing lad who's got a very unbalanced diet. So his parents wondered whether he actually had a phobia around food. I think phobia's perhaps a bit extreme. He's not panicking. No. I think he's going to be a difficult one. The most important thing is it's making sure that he's actually getting a nutritionally balanced he's getting diet. The right nutrients. It'd be nice on a Sunday just to go for a carvery and him sit there and eat. I didn't yeah. want to. Four carvers, please. Yeah. <laughs> but before investigating Bobby further, our doctors have another tot to tackle, a three-year-old whose terrible twos are becoming very tricky threes. Jessie J, when she wants something, it can become very, very no. difficult. <laughs> it can be anywhere. It can be at home or it can be out. <laughs> She'll literally lie on the floor, kicking, screaming, crying. It's very, very much like having a baby, but a big baby. <laughs> Just, uh... <laughs> Pediatrician Dr Ravi Jairam and GP Dr Dawn Harper are helping children like Jessie J <laughs> by working out whether these badly behaved kids need a medical diagnosis or stricter parenting. <laughs> In my family, there's me, my wife Marie, and my two daughters, Jessie, Jay, and Lexi Lee. Come on, this is Jessie. No. No. Oh, I don't know what you want, baby. Want, baby. At meal times, I try to sit down as a family. Jessie. <laughs> Jessie won't sit at the table. If I try and make her sit at the table, she can get into a really emotional state. Jessie, can you come and sit down, please? Jessie. 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 Come on. She doesn't eat. Much. Is that enough? Oh, hang on. Hang on. <laughs> I was about to say she polished off a lot of the banana. She's not too good with sharing. She'd prefer to just destroy it. Ow! That's not being a good girl, is it? <coughs> I don't know why she does it. <coughs> Jessie J is nearly three years old. Yeah. yeah. She can't speak. She's very vocal, but it's just noises. There's no words. Jessie! There's no words She usually, like, does a, a weird noise. The first thing you've got to do is make sure this child can hear properly. Yeah, if you're not hearing it, you're never going to learn to say it. But she's had a hearing tests that's normal. Uh, mommy, mommy, this, no. What? She does communicate in her own way. She makes it obvious what she does and doesn't want to well, do. Well, but that would be really useful to ask her parents. You know, if you ask her to bring me the book, show mm. me the cup, mm -hmm. is it actually making sense or is it just a jumble? <laughs> We've got to go home, baby. <laughs> she can't say, Mummy, I need you. She'd usually just cry. <laughs> it's not a tantrum. It's an emotional frustration. <laughs> Relax, I can't calm her down. She'll calm down when she wants to calm down. Come on. But it can be a few hours. I don't know how to deal with it. Because I don't know what it is. Not being able to communicate with your child. I just found it so difficult. It's horrible not being able to reassure her.
by the age of three, children should be using sentences of four or five words. But with over a million children in the UK living with speech and language difficulties, Jessie J is not alone. <laughs> Of course, along the way, if you can't express yourself for whatever reason, you're going to get very, very frustrated. You're going and, to interrupt, aren't you? And that could be a very neat explanation for all of the problems she's got. I need help now to take her down the right path. If she does need help, that's OK. We just need to know what kind of help she needs. I'll tell you the thing that strikes me. I don't think there was a single moment when we saw that child without a dummy in her mouth. And that may or may not be significant. <laughs> Dr Ravi needs to meet both Jessie J and Bobby face to face. So he's hit the road. First stop, Lancashire. Hiya, hello, you're Jessie J's mum. I am. Hello, are you Jessie J? Can we do a high five? Oh, nice to meet you. You're very cute. Oh, who's that over there? What's that? Doggy. Hello, doggy. Yeah. She looked me straight in the face. She high-fived me. She oh, took me going? to see the dog. So all of that shows that she's she was comfortable with me. Hello. I can see. Your mummy's sitting here. Dr Ravi's investigating whether Jesse Jay's having typical toddler tantrums <laughs> or whether there's something more serious going on. Jay. <gasps> What's this? Watching her play was really revealing. That's... She has good imaginative play. How have things developed in terms of her communication? There's a few words. They're not clear like me and you would say them. OK. Oh, is that for Mummy? Yeah, I've got to feed her. Ah. <laughs> Are you spitting it out? She's definitely yeah. trying to make sentences, isn't yeah. she? I couldn't understand what she was saying but no. I don't know whether you could no. follow it. So even you were struggling with that. Oh, is your feeling yeah. that she's made progress oh. or is she no further on from where she was six months ago? The single words she does say are definitely getting clearer. Yeah. Yeah. All done now. All done, have you had enough? What a good girl. There does still seem to be some underlying reason why she's not speaking as she should. I do think it would be extremely useful to get a specialist speech and language therapist involved, yeah. just to help to continue to develop her speech and language skills. Super See ya, fun. you get a high five. five. Yay! Hey. But will solving Jessie J's communication problems sort out her tornado-like tantrums? I think the day I have a conversation, we are probably cry. <laughs> Dr Ravi's next appointment is with eight-year-old Bobby, whose problems are proving hard to swallow. This is Bobby's bag. This is Bobby's everyday fridge. He didn't eat the brownie. <laughs> In his pack lunch, he had a bar of chocolate, a yoghurt, a Milky Way, fruit gums and a chocolate brownie. The family think Bobby has a food phobia. But despite seeing health visitors, paediatricians and psychologists, they're no closer to broadening Bobby's bizarre diet. Bobby's obviously had a lot of input from a lot of people, and yet he still has this issue around his eating. Whether that's a learned behaviour, because he knows by doing that he will actually get some sweet stuff, which is what he seems to exist on, or whether there's a physical problem there, I don't know. Hello, are you Bobby? Yeah. How are you doing? Dr Ravi, Hi. nice to meet you. Hi. 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 To all intents and purposes, he's very sociable, he's got absolutely normal behaviour. I'm not advocating uh. that... <laughs> <laughs> Pardon me. I'll give you six out of ten for that one, <laughs> just for the surprise element. <laughs> he gets on well with children at school, and then it comes to his meal times. So, first up is I want you to pull a face like that for me so I can see inside your eyes. Is that okay? <laughs> so you look lovely and pink in there. So that... He looks like he's doing okay. It doesn't look like he's anemic. Yeah. Can I pull you so that you're lying flat? Yeah. He's growing nicely. Yeah. His tummy feels fine. There's no ulcers or anything in his mouth. And his teeth don't look too bad, to be honest. So, ah. Ah. What a big mouth. People would often just say, oh, he's a fussy eater, get on with it. But I think for Bobby's parents and for Bobby, this is a major issue. At this age, I think there's a chance perhaps to help him to unlearn some of this. I'd really like to get a psychologist involved to help mum and dad, and more importantly, to help Bobby himself with strategies to try to expand his diet a little bit. Even if you can 
you know, get him into eating pizza or yeah. a burger or sausages or so. Oh, you like pizza, do you? No, no, we no really we don't. Want, it's one of those food he really wants to eat into. And the fact that he wants to do it, I think, is a really positive thing and just gives me that little light at the end of the tunnel. Bye bye. 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 It's nice that we're going to get, hopefully, what we've been asking for for a long time. Oh, yeah. Which is obviously a psychologist to assess him and find out what, what's causing the issue. I like to eat pizza, it would make me happy. <laughs> <laughs> but the pleasures of pizza are still a long way off. To find the answers as soon as possible that parents have struggled to get for years requires a team of experts. I'd like to ask Helen Gill, who's a speech and language therapist, to meet Jessie J and her parents. A lot of people think that a speech and language therapist is just there for people with stammers and people who can't quite say words, but what they can actually do is look at the whole process of communication. A three-year-old might not speak for a variety of reasons, but one thing I do know is that it's rarely straightforward. There's normally an awful lot of factors at play. Hello! Hi, uh, nice to meet you. I'm Helen. Oh, no! <gasps> wow! He's a spider. There he is again. Pretty spider. It was really interesting that she might have spoken about something that she'd enjoyed when she was looking at the book, but she didn't look at me with a social check to make sure that I was also looking at that. And I've got my favourite little horsey. No. No? Boo! Pew! Stinky sock. Oh. Hairbrush, cup, plate, fork. These are all words that really should be very familiar to an early three-year-old. Jessie J, can you show me the hairbrush? Where's the hairbrush? It was really interesting that she really wasn't willing to follow my instructions in terms of actually even looking at them or even noticing them. Where's the hairbrush gone? Go. Oh! Where's the hairbrush? There's a smelly sock. And that's quite unusual for a little girl of the age of three. Well, I think we're pretty much done for today. Just as I was leaving, I was aware that Jessie J was using a little bit of peripheral vision, which meant that she was looking just out the corner of her eye and not in a communicative way, she was just looking at things around her. <laughs> to a speech and language therapist, we would certainly regard that as being quite significant. Helen has spotted some subtle signs that could indicate this isn't just a speech delay. Whilst on the surface this might look like quite a straightforward case of a little girl not developing spoken language, I think actually there's an awful lot of factors at play here. Bye. 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 Bye! And I want to take all of those observations back to the team because I think we've got some really interesting things that we need to consider. One possibility is autism, which affects around 1 in 100 people. It's a condition where pathways in the brain are different, affecting social skills, communication and behaviour patterns, such as a fixation on particular interests. Up to 90% of people on the spectrum also have sensory issues around smells, sounds or textures. It's very typical for toddlers to display autistic traits, such as not making eye contact, having tantrums and repetitive behaviour. But as they get older, children whose brains work a little differently start to stand out from the crowd. The average age for an autism diagnosis is around five and a half, but remarkably, four times more boys are diagnosed than girls. World expert Professor Tony Atwood strongly disagrees with this ratio of boys to girls with autism. I think it's actually probably 50-50 but the girls are much smarter in camouflaging their social confusion. Girls tend to be diagnosed as teenagers and adults when the wheels fall off. The boys will tend to be explosive or totally isolated, whereas the girls tend to be much more constructive of what am I supposed to do here? They are often better observers and analyzers and imitators, and some become literally successful actresses. It's thought that girls with autism are so good at copying those around them that many slip under the radar. I think there are many women who have undiagnosed Asperger's syndrome. What they may present with is depression and low self-esteem, high levels of anxiety in situations, other clinical conditions such as anorexia nervosa, borderline personality disorder. Women are twice as likely as men to experience anxiety, and recent research suggests one in five girls with anorexia also display autistic traits. But with an earlier diagnosis, their lives could be very different. Helen's called a meeting with Dr. Dawn and Dr. Ravi to discuss Jessie J. 
she was using words appropriately. She was actually putting two words together from time to time as well. It seemed that she had good imaginative play and I didn't feel that it was on balance more likely that she had an, a, a wider behavioural problem. Because she's a girl, I think she actually understands quite a lot of around basic learned social interactions. So she does greet you, she can say goodbye, she can do very set what looks like imaginative play. Hey, let's draw mummy. But in terms of true, flexible, extending your play, I didn't see evidence of that. By imitating people around her, Helen thinks Jessie J might be hiding the signs of autism, but some traits, like peripheral vision, she cannot conceal. What I was concerned about with her expressive language is definitely affected by the dummy, and that's affecting yeah. all her speech sounds as well. Pretty spider. But I also think it's providing a bit of a red herring because I think it gives the impression that actually there might be more language there than there possibly is. Ah, so those are quite yeah. subtle, they are. subtle things, yeah, and they I are. certainly didn't pick up on them in the brief time I spent there. So you're looking more perhaps towards there being an element of a social communication problem then? I think it's something we can't rule out. If you are looking to make a diagnosis of something like autism, you are effectively looking at a lifelong condition and it's important that we're absolutely certain before we label a child. It's not clear cut with Jessie J. So the team must look for more clues about her behaviour. Yeah. In Doncaster, eight-year-old Bobby's food issues are also far from straightforward. Do you want a chip? Can we tell him No. No. Even when the family eat out, Bobby brings his lunchbox of chocolates and yoghurt. We always used to look, like, make sure then we do a look and we get the lunch bag out, but we just stop looking now, aren't we? Yeah. Hello. Bobby's diet desperately needs to change, but straight away, the team hit a hurdle. I'm fine. The team are diagnosing children like Bobby, whose behaviour could have a medical explanation or could just be down to years of getting their own way. Hello. Bobby only eats sweets, yoghurts and baked beans, which his parents believe is a food phobia, so Dr Ravi sent the family to meet psychologist Dr Leanne Tidsey. You comfortable there? Yeah. yeah. Good. Around three kids in every classroom have a mental health condition, but sadly only a quarter receive support. How do you manage at school? Mummy makes me a pat lunch. It can be very hard sometimes to understand why something that's such a basic part of life can become such a problem to some individuals and some families. As Dr Leanne digs deeper, the going gets tough for Bobby. This is a hard question, Bobby. What stops you from eating things? You just could tell me what you've been telling me. Can you me? say, go on, I'd like to go hear. Go on. Go on, yeah, I've got it. How are you feeling? What are you crying for? Oh, no. Can, can Daddy say it for you? Yeah. Is that all right? Yeah. Right. Oh. oh, what's making you feel upset? <laughs> Okay. It's a big step for Bobby to open up about why he's scared. Big breath, see if you can say it. It's in my head that I can't eat it. Yeah. It's in your head that you can't eat it. This is really hard to say, isn't it? Mm. It's in my head that I can't eat it, but I can see seeing you again. <laughs> You're saying that you can? So is it like an argument in your head? Yeah. Sometimes people get alarmed when they hear young children talking about voices. I think this is just Bobby's way of expressing himself that there's a battle going on inside him. It's like there's two voices, one saying that he should try it and the other saying that he can't. Um, that suggests to me that the main difficulty for him is a fear response to the food. Even though there's that voice saying that you can't, there's a strong bit of you that's saying that you can. And maybe in time what we can do is get that bit stronger and get it to win and beat the other bit that says that you can't. This condition has been around for all of Bobby's life and it's very hard to make changes to those sorts of difficulties. It will 
involve putting Bobby into positions where he does feel uncomfortable and I think his parents will find that difficult. I think they like any good parent and they don't like to see their child upset. Once everyone's done their separate assessments, it's really important to get everybody sitting down around the table together so that we can put together the whole picture of what's going on. This is the recognised route for diagnosis. Unfortunately for many families, it can take years. But for Bobby, the assessment's taken just a few weeks. A bit nervous, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's been a concern now for getting on seven or eight years, so we're really looking forward to today. <laughs> Mum and Dad think Bobby has a food phobia. But today, they find out from the team led by GP Dr Dawn if that is what is stopping him scoffing. I personally didn't think there was a medical issue and I wasn't convinced there was a, an underlying wider behavioural issue. I do think that the family have got into quite a pattern now, compensating for the difficulties so that meal times are, are pleasant times. And the default position is the chocolate mousse. But I think we can't afford to leave this another five years because yeah. actually he's going to become really medically unwell. Because his diet it's, is, is it's appalling. Shocking. I think now's a good time to get them. Yeah. Hi, Hi, Sally, I'm Dawn. Hi, nice to meet you. Hi, Craig. Hi, nice this is not just about Bobby. This is going to be about the family. It's going to be about parents taking a very big role as well in making changes. You ready, Bobby? Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> Hi, Bobby, how are you doing? Hi. If we got him eating pizza, sausages and burgers, that would be tremendous progress. The whole point of today is to try and work out how we can help you, Bobby, to eat a little bit more. Is that what you'd like? Yeah? OK. It's clear that he's fine with food until it gets near his mouth. Um, and it did strike me that there was obviously something that was just stopping him taking that extra step. I think, for Bobby, there is some genuine fear there about trying new things. I think it's quite a scary thing to think about trying new foods. Do you think it's generally just a phobia then? I think what Bobby does have is some fear of trying new foods, but I don't think it's to the extent that we would call it a phobia. But I think that's something that we, we need to just keep an eye on. Previously, Bobby used to get anxious at meal times and the dishes chucked all over the place and mm. life weren't great, were it? So are we ending up going back to that stage? We do not want to put you in a situation where your little boy is ultra stressed. That is not what we're aiming to do at all. In fact, what, what we're aiming to do is exactly the opposite. You look really anxious and a bit tearful. <laughs> is there anything specific that we've said that's upset you? Or no, it's just the situation as a whole. Whenever you talk about it in depth, it's sort of brings home the reality of, of the situation. Actually accepting that there's a problem and facing up to it is the first step in correcting it, OK? And I know Leanne's got some great ideas. And what I want to do is do some work around anxiety and do some structured work around starting to introduce some different foods. This isn't something that's going to change overnight. Mm -hmm. It's going to take some time and it's going to take some really hard work. Yeah. So, does that sound good to you? Mm -hmm. Brilliant. And you definitely want to be able to eat more stuff. Mm -hmm. Cool. Mm -hmm. Whether we'll be successful or not, I don't know. What I'm optimistic about is that he himself is motivated to do it, and that is going to be key to everything. Okay. See ya. So Bobby doesn't have a food phobia. However, if his anxiety with new foods isn't sorted soon, it could become one. Dr Leanne is confident this is a battle he can win. The most difficult thing is how long the difficulties have been around for and of course the longer habits are around for the more difficult they can be to change. We know he's not going to sit down next Sunday and have a Sunday dinner but I think we've waited this long we can let it take us a bit longer. As long as Bobby's happy there's no reason why we, we can't get to where we all want to be. <laughs> Bobby's had his expert assessment but for Jessie J there's still more sleuthing to be done. Keep going. Keep going. <gasps> Should we go see? Myself and Dr Ravi made quite different observations for Jessie J. He was feeling she was just perhaps a little bit behind for her age, whereas the things that I was observing did actually allude to there might be some differences in her interaction. Jessie J, do you think baby might like to go to sleep? <laughs> Helen's noticed Jessie J is reluctant to follow instructions do you think baby and play imaginatively. So I've brought some toys with me today, and they're the typical sorts of toys I'd expect a little girl of around the age of three to show some interest in. Is Baby talking? <laughs> wow. He 
imaginative play, sort of knowing how to play socially with toys, with dolls and things like that, can often be an area where children who have an autism spectrum disorder would struggle with. Should we change baby's bottom? Let's get baby out. Helen's pleased to see Jessie J's dummy free. Pooey baby. Give her a baby. What a massive difference without the dummy. I just had to bat the bullet and just did take you? it off here. Yeah. What was really interesting was Jessie J's talking today because she's now not got the dummy. Of course, I could hear a lot more of the words she was saying. And what was really mainly noticeable was that every time I said anything, she repeated it straight back. There. There. Get you dressed, baby. Okay, baby. This repetition called echolalia can be a sign of autism. Wiggle, wiggle. A lot of young children will copy language because that's how they learn vocabulary, of course. But for Jessie J, it did it seem to be different to that. She seemed to literally lift whole phrases and repeat them immediately. There you go, baby. Okay, baby. She OK? You OK? I wanted to see what would be her reaction to being tickled from behind. I could see that she could feel it, but she didn't fully turn round and look at me. It's interesting, my observations so far have been quite different to Dr Ravi's. It tells us, one, that it's really important to always work in a team. Can I tickle you? Can I tickle you? The other thing to consider is that girls who have an autism spectrum disorder or who show those differences in their development, they are much more subtle. Bye. Bye -bye. <laughs> Whilst Jessie Jay's hanging out with Helen, Bobby's also getting a home visit. Given Bobby's limited diet, I'm concerned about him becoming malnourished. I think it would be good to ask Gillian Farron, our dietitian, to meet with his parents just to give them some advice, really. Gillian's showing Bobby and his mum just how unbalanced his diet is. The first tower shows Bobby's diet now. That's right. Bobby's the orange bricks on both towers represent snacks and high-fat, sugary foods. Bobby's currently consuming 11 times the recommended amount for his age. It's a lot of orange. Orange, orange, orange. What we know from recent research is that children who struggle with their diet also struggle with their learning and behaviour at school. One, two, three. Whilst Bobby gets a lesson in healthier habits, mm -hmm. Helen's taken her investigation to Jessie J's nursery to see if she has the same rigid routines outside of home. As soon as we say it's time to go out to play, Jessie automatically goes and gets her wellies right, on. Right, even though none of the other children are doing yes. that. Yeah. If you suggested that she didn't put her wellies on, would you anticipate that that would be problematic for her? Or? Yeah, she would get a bit upset and a bit distressed. So even in summer, Jessie J is sticking to routines she first learnt in winter. Well, this has been a really useful day for me. I've got loads of information to take back to the team. There we go. There we go. This one. If Jessie J is on the autistic spectrum, finding the right support early could be life-changing, providing her with a much brighter future. 15-year-old Rosie was diagnosed with high-functioning autism, age nine. I think everyone's brain is wired differently, but um, my brain is wired extra differently, like super deluxe differently. Uh, little brother Lenny has autism and my parents were getting all these books um, to try and understand what what they were dealing with you uh, yeah. and I read one and uh, I managed to link up a few of the symptoms to myself and it turns out my parents had as well. It doesn't really affect me as much as it used to. I still like my things in a very specific order like my CDs have to be in alphabetical order, my books have to be in alphabetical order and if it isn't, I'd, I freak out of it. <laughs> I fidget a lot um, because my mind's always running. My mind's kind of connected. Well, everyone's mind connected to their body, but um, when my mind gets excited, my body gets excited, so I, I'm always fidgeting. It's thought seven out of 10 people with autism have mental health problems like anxiety or depression. So having people around them who understand the condition is crucial. I got a lot of support from my friends and family once I got diagnosed, especially when in high school, when I was really, really down. And I don't think I would have got through without that support, so I have that I owe them a lot. Rosie's already written her first book, illustrated another, is learning the guitar and applying for college. As far as I'm concerned, I'm like a lot of teenagers. Because of my diagnosis, I've got a lot of opportunities. So, I'm very happy that I got it. 
The earlier the diagnosis, the more support can be put in place to manage problems like anxiety. Today, Bobby's facing his anxiety as he starts work with Dr Leanne to win his war against food. It's the first session and what I'm really hoping to do today is first of all set some goals and then start some practical work with Bobby. Do you think that you could draw a really wide ladder that fills that whole page? Yeah. The idea with the ladder is that it allows us to get a structure around the different challenges that Bobby needs to take on. If you're going to climb up a ladder, where do you start? Here, at the bottom. Go Down on. at the bottom of the ladder, we can put the foods that are perhaps a little bit easier for him, and we can put the more difficult things right up at the top of the ladder. What things might go here? Fish. Have fish. fish. Never. Never. Would you never do fish? No. For him, eating fish feels like a really, really difficult task. Poor fish, who's cooked that? <laughs> Whereas food's down at the bottom of the ladder, he actually sounded quite excited about. What I'm trying to do is just get him enthusiastic, get him motivated, and hopefully make some positive steps. So poppadoms, Bobby wants to start with. Does that sound like a reasonable place? Yeah, if that's where he wants to be, it's, isn't it, Bobby? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bobby's not going to be able to do this on his own. Sally and Craig need to stick with it and not back down, but to encourage him to keep going with it. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> See you. As soon as he gets home, Bobby is keen to start climbing his food ladder. Tonight I'm going to try the... Papa Doms. So, uh, you ordered Papa Doms. <laughs> <laughs> Bobby's only ever eaten yoghurts, sweets and baked beans. Could a poppadum be one bite too far? Is it nice? There's not a scary about it, is it? It's just like crisp, isn't it? Would you rather not eat it? Have you had enough? It doesn't taste as bad as I thought it Well, get it, then. Ignore your mum, tell you to leave it. Eat it. No, we'll be told not to let him go at his own pace. Yeah. I reckon he can eat another half of that. He's done well, haven't you, mate? Sally needs to calm down a bit when he's eating, I think. I don't, I think you need to calm down. But she said to him at his pace and he's eating because you're asking him to. Not because you could see him struggling. Leanne's watching the footage to see how Bobby fared with his first ever poppadum. Oh, there's a lot of tension in that situation there. It's all about going at his pace, not because he shouldn't have Everybody, just stop fighting! Don't interrupt me, please, Bobby, because you're going to get me angry. Bobby's getting a real mixed message from his parents there. On the one hand, he's getting the encouragement to, to eat, but on the other hand, Sally's being quite nervous there, I think. If he's enjoying it, then there's no reason why he shouldn't carry on and, and eat a bit more. Well done, though, mate. High five. Well done, mate. I want to try peas next. Mum and Dad must work as a team to help Bobby to change the habits of a lifetime. It's diagnosis day for Jesse J. And Dr Dawn's brought together the team to decide whether Jesse J has a speech delay or autism. I'm feeling a bit nervous because you don't want to hear something. There's some things you don't want it to be, I suppose, and you want it to just be OK. Obviously, if there is something wrong with you, I don't know what it is. It could be nothing, could be something. It's just more important to know that I can help her down whatever road she needs to go. What about ah. Mummy? <laughs> For the past year, Mum and Dad have been concerned about three-year-old Jessie J's behaviour. Luckily enough, there weren't a car there. And today, they're hoping for answers. I'm nervous. I feel quite sick, <laughs> to be honest. But, fingers crossed, we'll, go, we'll move forward. Jessie J's been a puzzle from the start. But since their last meeting, speech and language therapist Helen has gathered more evidence for the team to see. My aim was to try and work out whether or not we're looking at a little girl who simply has delayed language or whether or not there could be something like an autism spectrum disorder going on. 
Okay. So I've brought some footage for oh, us to have a look at okay. today. Pick her up. Pick up baby. Pick up baby. <gasps> she's awake. When she's doing something she wants to be doing, she's quite happy to do it, but she's not taking any direction from Helen at all. Blow the candles out. She appears to be playing quite happily with Helen, but there's very little eye contact. When she was tickled on the neck there, she, she didn't really react. I mean, normally a child would at the very least look around. Tea time, baby. Tea time, baby. I was there for about an hour, and she just did the same thing again and again and again. I think mm. it's a little girl with limited play ideas. Quite rigid. Yeah. It sounds to me, Helen, like you're quite concerned. Yeah, yeah, I am really. I think certainly we do have a little girl who has significant numbers of behaviours and symptoms that could indicate yeah, autism spectrum I disorder. One, step, two, step. <laughs> I think we're probably at a stage where we're ready to have a chat with mum and dad, aren't we? I think so. Yeah? OK. It's never easy to tell parents things that they don't really want to hear, and it never gets any easier to do. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet but I think it's important for us as professionals, to be honest. So, um, do you want to come through and we'll tell you what we think so far? Yes, yeah, thank nice. you, yeah. Come on, then. We... Good girl. Good girl. Thank you. Nice to see you again. You too. Hi, Reverend Nice to meet you. Hi. 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 Hello. I think it's fair to say there's no doubt that we were all a little bit concerned about her speech. One of the things that um, Helen particularly noticed was some issues around how she actually interacts and communicates. We've had a long discussion and Helen's made some really interesting observations. And we do feel that with her communication issues, she does have a lot of features that would suggest that her behaviour fits into the autistic spectrum. And in many ways, it means that we can now move on mm. and, and do things to actually make things better. She's three. We've got a whole year to get her ready for school and get the right back up. I don't know, I think we just... I think everyone's been saying it could be that and, and we've just been not wanting it to be that. Yeah. More for a future, more than anything. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. I don't know, Helen, whether you just want to highlight some of the things that you found in your observations that made us come to the conclusions that we came to. I don't think any of us could question she's rather fixed in the way she thinks. <laughs> yeah. um, things are very much on her terms. She doesn't really engage in social chat. It tends to be what she's wanting to talk about. It's superb that you've managed to lose the dummy. What it's allowed us to hear, though, is that actually she's using a lot of echolalia, which means it's copying back of language. Yeah. Um, when I've said short phrases to her, she repeats them straight back. She was doing the same with you as well. Yeah, she does that a lot. Yeah, does, she? you're finding that that's happening, mm. yeah. It's more reinforcement to make sure that the dummy remains away, because mm -hmm. we want her to keep chatting. Does things like this get worse? In fact, I would say the opposite will be true, that once you've recognised that there's a problem mm. and you've got the backup and support, actually, the outlook for her is much better. I want to get in touch with your local team and flag up what we found on our assessments, and I'd really like them to be aware of what we think so they can pick up the ball and start running with it. Well, thank you. Right. Yeah. I think we had to tell Jessie J's parents that we felt that she was on the autistic spectrum. And judging from Mum's reaction, I don't think she was ready to hear that. I don't think she was expecting that. And I think it's going to take a little while for all of that to sink in, really. This way, OK. Mum's going this way, honey. It's an upsetting time, but I suppose... Upsetting, but... better that we know. A bit of know. closure, I think. Yeah. Yeah. The situation, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. And we can help her now and yeah. sort it out. Yeah. It's a major deal for any mum to face a diagnosis of something like autism in their child. But hopefully, when the dust has settled, Marie will see today as a positive thing because actually the outlook for Jessie J now she has a diagnosis is so much brighter. I want a kiss. Mm. Since the diagnosis, Chris and Marie are seeking more help and advice from their local NHS team. No, not dad. Not dad. <laughs> 14 weeks ago, Bobby had never had a hot meal. I'm not taking. And was existing on a diet of yogurts, beans, and sweets. Today he's visiting Dr. Leanne for the last time. Dr. Shirley on your video. Oh, look at you, tucking in there. It's 
it the first time you've had pizza? Yeah. You feel pleased with yourself? Yeah. And it's not just pizza that's making him proud. I have eaten 20 new foods. Sally and Craig have also been working hard. Nah, nah. I'm a bit of a soft touch. You're a bit more stern Yeah. Now. It's easy for me to say to him, like, if you don't eat it, there's no ice cream, and he sort of knows that that's how it's going to be now. With 20 new foods in his diet, an energised Bobby's on the right track. Just had his school report, and that's probably the best one we've had, yeah. isn't it? He's had some praise in for a change. Yeah. And he's having a proper pat lunch, yeah. shall we say. <laughs> he's got some food in it, yeah. rather than chocolate. Yeah. He came in the other day, didn't he? He says, I am not had a dairy milk in ages. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even a visit to the curry house is now without the lunchbox of chocolate. Oh. Come on, the big moment. <laughs> Still a long way to go in it by no stretch of imagination. One, Paul. But for now, chicken korma is still a dish too far. Oh, two bits of chicken on there as well. I know, I put them on. It's chuffed for himself, isn't it? He likes to tell everyone, doesn't he? I like pizza, cheesy sandwich, turkey dinosaur, Yorkshire pudding, poppadoms, and beans on toast. And peas. That was a lovely meal.